Well, we've been studying on Sunday nights in the Psalms. I don't know about you, but I enjoy the Psalms. They have a lot of tremendous things in there. Many of the Psalms are great about how we ought to rejoice and praise the Lord. Some of that's in tonight's Psalm. And I'll tell you, we cannot rejoice and praise the Lord enough. He's a great God. He has done much for us. He is doing much for us. And he's going to do more than we can even imagine. So we ought to start rejoicing and praising him now. Many of the Psalms are Psalms that are called Messianic. That means they talk about Jesus Christ coming into the world and what he would accomplish. Many of the Psalms are given to us to remind us of God's protection and care. I love Psalm 46.1. God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And isn't he? God's right there. When you need him, he always absolutely is. And so some of the Psalms are that way. Now, some of the Psalms, like tonight's, are called millennial Psalms. They really look ahead to what is coming in the future for God's people, Israel. But of course, we as God's saints will be there too in the millennial kingdom. So there's things that are said that ought to encourage us about what is coming for us as well in these Psalms. Other psalms, as you know, are psalms of rebuke. Some are psalms of confession. Uh, the evangelist mentioned Psalm 38. Psalm 38 is all about how God convicts us and how it works on us and how things are miserable for us till we get things right with the Lord. That's a good psalm to read and to study. So there's many great psalms, and we're going through selected ones. Tonight we come to Psalm number 68. As I mentioned, this particular psalm is called a millennial psalm because it has as its main theme the Lord and what he's going to do when he comes back in the future. I think some key verses, though, would be verse 18 and 19. These verse, or verse 18 is quoted in Ephesians chapter 4. So it applies to what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. Notice, thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. If you take your uh, Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 4 right fast. You'll see this verse quoted there, and it's applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, notice in verse number uh, uh, 9, no, verse 8, I'm sorry, verse 8 where it starts. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So there's the quote from Psalm 68 and verse 18. Definitely applies to what Jesus Christ has done. We'll mention that in just a few moments as we go on. This Psalm has been the inspiration for a lot of great men in the past who've had to go through some difficult times. Years ago, there was a group of Protestant people who believed the Bible in France called the Huguenots. The Huguenots were people that followed uh, more or less teachings of John Calvin and so on, and, and they believed the true gospel and everything in France, but the, France was a Roman Catholic country. And at that time, the Roman Catholics did not want any uh, difference in beliefs amongst their people, so they certainly persecuted and put to death many of the Protestants. Well, the Huguenots called this psalm the Song of Battle. The song of battle, because as it says in verse 1, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him flee before him. And they sang this, it was put to music, and they sang it when they went into battle. The Huguenots used this when they went into battle and fought their wars. It was, su was sung regularly from 1519 until 1605. Then a little later in 1621, there was a big siege of a place called Montaban, and a Protestant soldier was serving there in the king's army. 
He remembered the tune which had not been sung for several years and he decided to sing it. And he sang, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. And when that happened, a siege of the town of Montaban ended. Just because of a song that one man sang, the enemy left the city and stopped the siege. How about that? Would you ever think a song could stop something like that? But it did in that particular case. There's a famous man named Antony way early in the history of the church, 251 to 356. And this particular man had battles all the time with Satan. Whenever Satan came after him, he would quote much of Psalm 68 to get victory over him. How about that? Using Psalm 68 against the devil. Charlemagne, you ever heard of him? The man who really united France into one country and all and was uh, called Charles the Great too, but became Charlemagne. And that great man believed Psalm 68 was the greatest psalm of all of them. He loved Psalm number 68. This was kind of interesting too. Lord Cromwell in England back in 1653 had Psalm 68 read to all of his army officers before they went into battle. And he would say this, at the close of the reading of the psalm, he said, the Lord shaketh the hills and mountains and they reel, and God hath a hill too, a high hill as high as Bashan, and the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels, so let us dwell upon that and win. How about that? Lord Cromwell in England quoted this passage as well. And the French army during Napoleon's age marched into Russia. They marched right straight to Moscow and burned the city. But then it was winter time. They didn't have enough provisions and French soldiers began to freeze and began to not have enough provisions to eat so they started on a hasty retreat. They couldn't get out of Russia fast enough. They were really defeated there. Napoleon's turning point was trying to march into Russia. By the way, later on, Adolf Hitler made the same mistake. He rushed into Russia in the wintertime and wound up having a lot of his tanks and things get stuck in mud and the, the terrible freezing temperatures just dis, disheartened his troops and he suffered the same defeat going into Russia that Napoleon had years before. But anyway, whenever Napoleon's army left Moscow after they had burnt it, a large church service was held in Moscow at the Metropolitan Church, as it's called, and the, the preacher preached from this verse 1, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. How about that? That's exactly what happened for the Russians at that particular time. John Bunyan, one final thought. John Bunyan, you familiar with him? The author of Pilgrim's Progress, uh, years ago it was a second selling book to the Bible. Second most sold book to the Bible in the world. Outstanding book on the Christian life. If you haven't read it, still pertinent today. You ought to take an opportunity to ride Pilgrim's Progress. I forget which grades in our school have to read it, but uh, they have to read it in our school as one of the reading books. Great book. Well, anyway, he absolutely loved this psalm as well, Psalm 68. And he said, Thou hast received gifts of men, yea, even for thine enemies. And he said, If God had gifts for his enemies, how much more does he have gifts for me? That was his saying. And he put that in a book that he wrote entitled Grace Abounding. So, folk, here's the point. Psalm 68 may not be one of the psalms that stand out to you, but it's meant a lot to people in the past. And we ought to take a look at it tonight just briefly, looking at some of these verses, not taking a long time. If you were to make an outline of Psalm 68, it basically falls into four different categories. There's an introduction in verses 1 through 6 showing what God's enemies are going to face compared to what God's people are going to face. And then beginning in verse number 7 and 8, 
There's redemption from Egypt that seems to be referred to there. In verses number 9 to 19, redemption over the Canaanites, and that was under Deborah and Barak. We'll see that. But all of this kind of pictures the millennial victories that God will have over his enemies to set up the kingdom in the future, but seem to be referring to this. And then we have redemption in the future, verses number 20 through 35, looking at the millennial kingdom. So four main parts of this particular psalm. Look at the introduction again. Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. We could say God has certainly done that in the past. The mightiest army in the world at the time of the Israelites being in captivity was Egypt. Egypt was a mighty kingdom. But you know, when the Israelites were led by God out of Egypt and crossed that Red Sea, the Egyptian army was no match for Almighty God. He arose, and when their army went right to the middle of the Dead Sea, God had the waters close back up on them, and they were absolutely all destroyed, and his people were safe. Later on in Israel's history, <clears throat> We know that oftentimes God's people were in great peril. For instance, Hezekiah was besieged by the Assyrian king Sennacherib. They were shut up in Jerusalem. They're running out of food. People were just starving to death. It didn't look like there was any hope. But Rob Shaka, one of the leading men under Sennacherib, came up and defied the living God before the people of Israel at their wall said, don't trust in God. Hezekiah's God can't deliver you. Woo! What a challenge to put forth to God. He says, look at all the other gods we've conquered. Well, they conquered all the other gods because they weren't gods. But he defied the living God in heaven. Hezekiah prayed. Do you remember his prayer? Just read this in my devotions, 2 Kings chapter number 18. And uh, he prayed, and guess what? A death angel came, wiped out overnight 185,000 men. Can you imagine? I always like the verse that says, they woke up in the morning, they were all dead corpses. <laughs> well, basically not all the people died. We know that Sennacherib himself escaped and went back to his uh, main city of Nineveh. And at Nineveh there, his own sons killed him killed him as he worshiped in the temple of his God. His own sons killed him. So, you know, you defy the living God, watch out. You never know what's going to happen. It just brings me even to modern day and time. I saw this in my own life years ago, and I've told you this story before, Faith Baptist in Danville. Faith Baptist Church in Danville, when my dad pastored there in the 1960s and 70s, they had a tavern next door. And the people got burdened about that tavern. People were coming in there and being loud and noisy even during church services, throwing rocks and hitting the church building and stuff. So they put these great big signs on the side of the church that said, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise, Proverbs 21. They put a huge sign, eight foot sign on the side of the church building. So everybody came in there, saw that sign. And some of those people got kind of convicted. And they told the owner, owner of the tavern, they said, you know, that sign might be hurting your business. When people drive up there and see that sign, some of them are turning around. It's bothering them. So one day, the owner of that tavern and the bartender over there came over to see my dad. At that time, he had an evangelist there for a revival meeting, uh, Evangelist Lyons, a uh, great evangelist of the past. And anyway, I was home at the time, and they came over to my dad's office, and the owner of that tavern told my dad, he says, look, we're tired of you trying to give us a problem with our business. You take down your signs, or we're going to put your church out of business. We will put your church out of business. He said that. 
Let me tell you something. That's quite a challenge to God to say something like that. Within six months, the owner of the tavern traveled to Arizona on a trip and was shot to death. The bartender developed cirrhosis of the liver and died within one year of seeing my dad. You play around with God and God can arise up and absolutely take care of you. I'm thankful we got a God that can take care of us. Amen? He can deliver in amazing ways. Look at verse number three. But in contrast to what God can do to the wicked, let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Why? Because God can give us victory over our enemies. And you know the worst enemies we have, folk, and I preach on them this a preach about him this morning is the devil and the world and the flesh. Three great enemies we face. But you know what? God's more powerful than all of them. They can be overcome. If you will absolutely know God's word, and like I preached this morning from Matthew 4, Jesus overcame the devil by quoting scripture to him. Three times when he tried to tempt him, Jesus overcame him with scripture. So when you know the word of God and you hide God's word in your heart, then you don't have to sin against God. You can overcome temptation. So definitely we ought to rejoice that we can have victory over the forces of evil. And then a great verse in verse 5, a father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. There was another, I, I had several more illustrations to give you, but there was another man back in the uh, uh, 1500s that was caught and was going to be hung for his faith in Jesus Christ. When they were ready to hang him, he had a wife and children at home. They said, do you have anything to say? He said, yes. And he quoted Psalm chapter 68 and verse 5. A father of the fatherless and a judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. When you kill me, my wife and children will be taken care of by God. What faith the man had as they hung him to death for his faith in Christ. And so these verses have meant a lot to a lot of people, and God is that way. You know, God's going to help those who are in a disadvantaged situation. If you say, oh, I've lost my father, what am I going to do in life? You know, God will take care of you. He'll provide. He'll bring somebody along. Somebody will take you up and help you out. Certainly that will happen if you trust the Lord. Or also here, if you happen to be a widow and you say, well, I'm going to do it without my husband. I don't know how I can get along, how I can live, how I can make it without my husband. Well, it's not easy. It'll be difficult, but God's there for you. He'll take care of you and help you as long as you're living in this life. Trust him. Challenge the Lord. Say, Lord, you promised to take care of me. And he will. The Lord will do that. And of course, also, as it mentions here, uh, God will be the judge of them too. Verse 6, God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. You see all the contrasts here between those who are righteous and those who are not. Now we come to point number two, seems to refer in verse seven and eight to God's deliverance, redemption of Israel out of Egypt. Know what's, notice what's said. O God, when thou wentest forth before thy people, when thou didst march through the wilderness, Selah, think of that. God was with his people in the wilderness. Now in the wilderness, there's not much to eat. It's dry. But out there, did God take care of his people? He first of all gave them manna to eat. He then had Moses strike the rock and out gushed water. By the way, you know how many they believe came out of Egypt? 1.2 million people, counting all the husbands and wives and children. That's what's believed came out of Egypt. Now Moses struck that rock to give a drink to 1.2 million people is not a small amount of water. So that rock had to keep giving out water. There's many who believe this, that that rock went along with Israel wherever they went. 
It does mention in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the rock that followed them. And so very likely God provided for his people by having that rock. Can you imagine one big rock? There's your water fountain. Never runs dry. God keeps water pouring out of that rock all the time. Whatever water you need, it's there for you. Now the people got to got, kind of got tired of God's food, manna. They complain and want something else. Well, God's generous and he takes care of his people. What did he give them? Quail. God gave them quail to eat. So they had some meat there to go with their manna that they had every day. God was gracious to see his people through the wilderness. What great redemption he brought to them. Then in verse 8, it seems to talk about the time they were at Sinai. The earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. He brought them to Mount Sinai. And what did God give his people there? The law. But as he was giving the law, that mountain smoked. There was fire. God's presence was there. By the way, Hebrews chapter number 12 and verse 29 says, Our God is a consuming fire. Now, it's hard for us to picture God in our hearts and minds. I mean, we can picture Jesus. And the picture that's in our mind of Jesus is Michelangelo's painting of him. But of course, nobody else ever saw or has a picture of Jesus from when he actually lived here. I mean, for a thousand plus years, Michelangelo didn't paint that to about, what was it, 1500 and something? I think it was in the 1500s when he painted that picture of Jesus. And everybody in their mind, oh, Jesus, yeah, I know what he looks like. Well, you're looking at a painting of Michelangelo. And everybody's used that picture of Jesus. But definitely, he might have looked quite a bit different than what that picture is. Nonetheless, when we think of God, how do you picture him? God's a spirit. You can't really see him yet. I believe he's going to take a form in the future when we're in heaven. Because Jesus in Revelation chapter 5 prevails to open up that little seven sealed book. And he goes over to him that sat on the throne and takes the book out of his hand. But other places say God the Father fills the whole earth. It says it's a consuming fire. So a lot of people when they think of God the Father, if you've ever seen pictures or shows, sometimes will just have a big ball of fire to picture God the Father. Nonetheless, when he did come down on Mount Sinai, he burnt the top of that mountain. Now, this is just a quick side note, but Brother Jim Taylor had a film a long time ago, not a real long time ago, but a film that believes the traditional site for Mount Sinai and the Sinai Peninsula, its name for it over there, is not really the place where God met with his people, the true Mount Sinai. Actually, they, some people think it's over in Arabia, and one reason is there's this mountain that's all burnt on the top of it. And, of course, uh, how did it get burnt? Why would a bunch of rock and stuff there? It shows a picture. It's a bunch of rock and stuff. It's all burnt. There's no volcano there. So how did that happen? So they think maybe this is the place where Mount Sinai actually was. Anyway, just a side note. But God absolutely came down, met his people, gave them the law, show them how to live. He says, if you obey my law, I'll bless you. You don't obey my law, I'll have to curse you. Pretty simple. God still says the same today. You follow his word and live for him, guess what? You're going to have the hand of blessing of God on you. You say, no, I want to go my own way. I want to live the way I want to live. I'm going to do what I want to do. Then you're not going to be blessed by God the way he wants to bless you. So honestly and truthfully, same today, God blessed his people. Great redemption there for his people out of Egypt. Then there's redemption coming in the future for all, or a redemption, I should say, of over the Canaanites here in verses 9 and 19. I got to move along here. Thou, O God, didst send a plentiful rain, whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary. Thy congregation hath dwelt therein. Thou, O God, hast prepared of thy goodness for the poor. Now, it's kind of hard to know what's he talking about. God sent a plentiful rain. 
whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance. Well, back there when Deborah and Barak had to face the Canaanites coming against them, God took care of their chariots by having a big rainstorm come and they couldn't get through the mud. So therefore they were able to defeat the Canaanites in that battle. Many think this is what this is referring to here, and it certainly could be. God can do all kinds of things to stop people from what they're planning on doing. And that's amazing to see what he's able to do. I like verse 11. The Lord gave the word, great was the company of those that published it. You know, whenever God gave the victory to Deborah and Barak, you'll find over there in the book of Judges, I think it's chapter 5, maybe it's chapter 6, I can't remember for sure, a big long song that they sang to the Lord, talking about his great deliverance. So it's thought maybe lots of people took up that song and just told people what God did to give them that great victory over the Canaanites who had oppressed God's people for over 20 years of servitude. God gave a great victory, and so they sang that song. Guess what? God gives us a lot of victories. The greatest one's our salvation. Don't you think we ought to do that? The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those that published it. I'd like to think that'd be true at Calvary Baptist. Great is the number of people that will publish the great message of salvation that God has given to us. Well, let's move on down through here. I like verse 17, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels, the Lord's among them as in Sinai in the holy place. You ever thought of how many main angels there are? We don't know. Over in the book of Revelation, it mentions there are 200 million at one particular place there, 200 million angels. Here it mentions 20,000 angels. You know, if it only took one angel to kill 185,000 Assyrians, <laughs> I think if there's just 20,000 angels, they could take care of the world, couldn't they? <laughs> but I don't know how many angels there are. But the point it's trying to give here is that the Lord uses angels to help his people. You ever thought about the fact that we don't worship angels? We don't talk about angels a lot. But in Hebrews 1.14, it says angels are ministering saints sent forth to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation. Who are heirs of salvation? We are. So the angels are spirits that minister to us. And I don't know what all they might do for us, but when we were little, over in Matthew 18, Jesus said we all had an angel watching after us. There was a little song that I used to learn when I was a little boy. My parents taught it to me. Um, uh, day. Oh, now I forgot. I was gonna. I was gonna sing it to you tonight. You're gonna be saved. That all day, all night, angels watching over me, my Lord. All day, all night, angels watching over me. You ever heard that? Few of you have. Truth, truth. Here it is. Angels are watching over us. What a great verse. That's true. Now, verse number eighteen. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men. That verse we know applies to what Jesus Christ has done because of Ephesians chapter 4. What does it mean that he led captivity captive as it says here? Perhaps a couple of thoughts. First of all, the Lord Jesus Christ and his great work on Calvary and his shed blood and his death, burial, and resurrection has allowed us to be freed from captivity to sin. Jesus said in John 8, 36, If the Son shall set you free, ye shall be free indeed. Before we're saved, we are captives to sin. So Jesus, through his salvation, can lead us out of that captivity. But then others in the context of Ephesians chapter 4 where it mentions Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth and I won't take time to talk about all of that but that's where Hades was located before his death, burial, and resurrection and Hades had two compartments a compartment of paradise and a compartment of suffering. In Luke 16, Jesus talks about that in the story of the rich man. But nonetheless, it's believed he descended there and told the thief on the cross, 
Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So he went to the paradise side of Hades in the center of the earth. But after three days and three nights when Jesus arose from the dead, then those people that were in the paradise part of the uh, uh, place of Hades were led out of there able to go to heaven because Jesus had taken care of their, of their sins. That's Old Testament saints. And so that is another view of what this means. The Lord Jesus ascended up on high and led those people who in a sense were captive in that place, couldn't go directly to heaven yet till Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. They absolutely were led out of there. It's interesting to study that sometime because remember when Saul wanted to call up Samuel? Where does it say Samuel came from? He came up out of the earth. He didn't come from heaven. And he would have been in heaven. He was a prophet of God. But he came up out of the earth. So I think that's true that before the time of the cross and the death and resurrection of Christ, we find that Old Testament saints were in the center of the earth in the place called paradise, which is there no more. It's now Christians go to heaven. Isn't that great? Because of Jesus Christ, to be absent from our body, we could be present with the Lord. Right in the presence of heaven because of what Jesus has done for us. Great passage here. Well, as you go on down, beginning in verse 20 to verse 35, and I'm not going to be able to go through these verses tonight because of time. We want to remember the Lord on this first Sunday of the month and the way he tells us to. But in the rest of this psalm, it talks about specifically the things that the Lord does in the future for his people, setting up his millennial kingdom. Notice verse 20, He that is our God is the God of salvation, and unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. God's able to deliver us from death and give us life. And that's what he's going to do for the nation of Israel. They're going to be like a dead man in the tribulation time prior to the millennial kingdom. If God didn't shorten those days, Jesus said there'd be no elect left on the earth. God's elect there in Matthew are his people, the Jews. They'd be totally wiped out. The Antichrist wants to do away with them. Why would the Antichrist want to do away with Jews? He's tried over and over again, uh, well, Satan's tried over and over again to get rid of God's people so that God's plans can't go forward. If he can destroy God's people, then God's plans can't go forward. Well, he's never been successful. He will almost be successful in the tribulation time. Very small remnant of Jews will be left, but praise God, God will deliver them They'll find out his salvation in that day. And look at verse 21. God will wound the head of his enemies and the hairy scalp of such a one as goeth on still in his trespasses. So boy, the Antichrist and false prophet and all those that lead doom against God's people in the tribulation time, they're going to come to their end. Revelation chapter number 20 and 19 talks about that, that when the battle of Armageddon is over, the Antichrist and false prophet are taken and cast into the lake of fire. You'll read it there in chapter 19, verse 20 of Revelation. But anyway, the Lord says in verse 22, I will bring again from Bashan, I will bring my people again from the depths of the sea. God is gonna gather his people back together and in the rest of this time, he talks about the different tribes that will be there that he's gonna gather them from. He loves his people, he knows who they all are. He'll bring them back into the land. And of course, notice there'll be peace in verse, well, look at verse 29, first of all, because of thy temple at Jerusalem shall kings bring presents unto thee. I was gonna take time to go back to Zechariah. Zechariah 14 says in the, Millennial kingdom age, all the kings and people of the earth will come and worship the Lord at Jerusalem. and They'll be, bring presents to him. That's what this is talking about. All the kings of the earth will be under Christ's control. They'll bring presents to him. And there'll be no more war, verse 30, rebuke the company of spearmen, the multitudes of the bulls with the calves of the people, till everyone submit himself with pieces of silver. Scatter thou the people that delight in war. War will be no more in the, in the millennial kingdom. God will make sure that all of the weapons are absolutely made into plowshares. That's in Revelation chapter 19. And there won't be fighting or war anymore at that time. Won't that be great to see? And then notice what it says also in verse number 33. To him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens which were of old, lo, he doth send out his voice, and that a mighty voice. 
So what do you do because of that? Ascribe ye strength unto God. His excellency is over Israel and his strength is in all the clouds. We need to talk about the Lord and how great he is. What he's done for us is going to do for us. Praise God for his greatness. O oh God, thou art terrible out of thy holy places. The God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Blessed be God. We have strength and power today because God gives it to us. We wouldn't have anything at all if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. But he has all power given unto him in heaven and earth, Matthew 28, 18. So he has the power to help us live this Christian life and make it through this life and make it right to him in glory. I don't worry one little ounce about not making it to heaven. You know why? Making it to heaven does not depend upon me. God is the one that takes care of me and leads me to heaven. When Jesus said in John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Boy, I'm in the hand of Jesus. And whenever I die, or I'd rather see the Lord come again, I'm going to go whoosh, right up to meet him. That's wonderful because of God's strength, because of God's power. That's why that will happen. Praise the Lord for that tonight. Well, we've got to close. We want to remember the Lord in the way he told us. Great psalm. I hope you'll read it over, contemplate it more. Uh, it's been such an encouragement, as I read some of them tonight, of saints of old and certainly can be an encouragement to us today. Heavenly Father, thank you for this great psalm that you've given to us Lord, I pray that we'll think about all the great things it says here, the contrast between the wicked and the saints and what you're going to do to the wicked and what the saints have and how you have great help for us and blessings for us. We can recount what you did to Israel and know you're going to do the same to us. Strength and power belong to you and you have that for us to make it through this life and all the way to heaven. Praise your holy name for that. And may we do what verse 3 says, rejoice and rejoice exceedingly over all that you have done, are doing, are going to do for us as your people. Bless us now as we remember you in the way that you told us to. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's just stand for a moment. And uh, boy, I forgot.